introduction here. My name is Carl Dabak. I'm on the board of Clifftop. Many of you are Clifftop members. All of you must be kindred spirits or you wouldn't be here. Uh, if you don't know about Clifftop, there's literature in the back. We do these programs maybe eight or ten times a year on different natural history subjects. Uh, a brief note about the upcoming. We're conducting a field trip on Saturday, 24th September, about mast. Mast is what the forest produces for other critters to eat. Nuts, acorns, grapes, droops, samaras, catkins. And two experts will lead it. Uh, Mark Brown, the District Forester with the Nature, uh, with the Department of Natural Resources. Bill McLean, retired IDNR botanist. It'll be done at White Rock. Our nature preserve complex, which called Top Owns. It'll be from 10 to 2. It'll be an easy hike. And what the two experts will do is show you every kind of mast that exists in our Bluff Corridor, Southern St. Clair, all of Monroe, and a little bit of Randolph County. And then October what? 11th? Good day? 12th. Uh, Saturday, 12th. October 12th is membership day at White Rock Nature Preserve, so all members are welcome. We give you lunch. We'll have gators to transport those who want to make the difficult Hill Prairie hike. Any other upcoming stuff, my friends at the board? Okay. We have two, two honeysuckle bowls coming up, and then we have our last seminar of the year, which will be in November. This is presented by Corey Byers, a graduate student at Southeast Missouri State. All of his research has been done at White Rock Nature Preserve. Even though it seems like it's a little bit of an obscure subject, the weevils of White Rock, it would encourage you to attend. Can't possibly do it. Well, obscure to many of us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Leslie Dean hails from Ohio. Uh, she went to Clara, Clarion. Clarion University of Pennsylvania. And in 2009, she became director of the first Polynitarian in the United States of America at the University of Illinois, a center dedicated to flowering plants and things that pollinate them and that inter-ecological relationship. Uh, Leslie, many of these people, I'm going to meet them now, are members of our cooked up organization of supporters. Hello. Okay. <laughs> so Leslie, please begin. Okay. Thank you. Well, as you can see, this is the front and side of our building. So um, we've painted it to get noticed. But it's funny because normally we have on the east side a big cornfield and on the north side a big soybean field. So you don't see it until you come down the little gravel drive. OK, so it is, as you said, dedicated um, to plants and their pollinators. We focus a lot on um, honeybees and native bees and butterflies. We talk about and mention hummingbirds and bats as well, but we focus more on the insects. So the honey, you guys have all heard about colony collapse disorder, is that correct? So the honeybees in 2006, it was noted that thousands of hives were dying. So envision, so normally when a beekeeper starts, he follows the bloom cycle. And if he's an East Coast person, he goes from Florida when the oranges start and then all the way up the coast um, to Maine um, where the apples are and on up to the cranberry bogs and things. And so he put his first hives out and when you have a hive, you have about 40 to 50,000 bees in one hive. You space it out in the orchard and, all right, I like bees, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk a lot about them like they're very cool little things. Um, so the girls don't need to be taught what to do. So first off, most of the work, all the workers are girls. So boys are around, but only occasionally and once in a while. And they only have one job. So, but the girls do, the, do all the work. So he sets his hives out, and they instinctively go out and start scouting and finding the buds and the blossoms. So he usually just leaves the hives and lets them do their work, and, which is just flying to the blossoms. For them, they're going to the blossoms to get two kinds of food nectar and pollen. 
for the flowers, they need the pollen moved around so they can have seed set and make oranges in this case. So he set his hives out, he left, he came back a couple weeks later, and he walked into the orchard and it was quiet. So why is it bad to have a quiet orchard with bees in it? Because the bees weren't doing their thing. So they weren't doing their thing. He, he didn't see any bees flying from the entrances up to the flowers. He didn't, I mean, when you walk up to a hive and, and they're active, you can actually, if you're quiet, you can hear them as you're approaching. So he's not hearing anything, he's not seeing anything, and his um, stomach starts to clench up about this point. He said he started flipping lids off of the hives, and there just weren't very many bees there. They, they weren't dead around the hive, they weren't dead in the hive, they just weren't there. Now this may have happened um, to one or two hives, but this happened to like 75% of his hives in this case. So he had just floored about, you know, what, they had noticed that some things were getting, there were some problems with the bees, they were starting to act sluggish and weird, but they were not expecting a spring where just, you know, hives disappeared. And, um, and even after they were set in and working. Now you expect winter kill, but you don't expect them to leave or to lose them after you've started your season and there's flowers there for them to feed on. So the big question came up as to why. So um, the honeybees are really tied into our agricultural system, especially everything that's orchard type, the oranges, the apples, the almonds. But it's an indicator species that the natives are probably in trouble as well. So um, if you look at it, um, over 75% of the flowering plants need pollinators. And this is agricultural as well as native things. They need the pollen move from flower to flower so they can have seed set and the flowers can continue to produce. Now we get interested because it's going to impact our food supply as well. Um, we don't want it to impact our agriculture and we don't want it to impact our, our natural systems. So now as Cliff Top, I, I guess I was curious what your goals and priorities were. Was it mostly the native areas or are you concerned with your surrounding ag areas too? Are you trying to conserve um, the native pollinators? Do you want to conserve bees more than butterflies or did you have what were your choices of what you're trying to conserve the most? Both. Both? Everything you can conserve? Yeah. Okay. And you're already doing um, number three there. So removing the invasive species. So we, we too are tackling honeysuckle. We have a very small plot at the pollinitarium. But we've been pulling honeysuckle since we've been there. And it's sprouting faster than we can, than we can pull it out. Okay. Biggest things, um, I just went to a pollinator conference in Pennsylvania. So this is such a big problem that, that actually in Pennsylvania has started a whole center called the Center for Pollinator Research. And this is the second conference they've held. They, they're going to hold it every three years now. I haven't told my department had this yet because they haven't seen it yet. They've asked us if we would host it in three years. And so they might have this in Illinois then in three years. Um, so they're concerned about the agricultural and the natural systems. One of the biggest things, and the chemical companies don't want us to say this, um, one of the big things impacting them is the pesticides. And this includes everything, uh, the fungicides, the herbicides, the insecticides. Even if it's not a chemical meant to kill a bug, it can still kill them or impact them. Uh, for instance, the almond growers, um, know that they have a big problem and that the chemicals they're using are also a big problem. So they're looking at, at this themselves. It was a strange mix of a meeting because it included growers, it included the chemical companies, the researchers, and then education and outreach people like myself. We were all coming together to try to figure out the best solutions and, and how to bring it to everybody and, and, and as quickly as possible and the things that make the most impact. Well, the thing that would make the most impact would be to reduce the chemical use. And if, if, the, if the grower still needs to use it, then to use the smallest amount possible and the smartest way possible. So an example of this is the almond grower uh, person representative said, 
We are looking at raising some of the almonds organically, but when we switched acreage into organic versus um, with using the chemicals, they got 500 pounds off the organic to 2,000 pounds off with the chemicals. So it's a really big impact for them if they have to go to straight organic. And, and things as simple as um, one of the ones they're looking at is, is a fungicide. It's not even an insecticide. They said that if we don't spray this fungicide, um, they don't set the fruit, the, the almonds don't set. They actually just fall off. But normally they spray this during the day. When do bees fly? So the bees fly during the day. So if we can get them to switch and spray it at night, um, then it can dry before the bees come back out in the morning and then the bees won't get into it. So they, they can save their fruit and they can not kill the bees. So some of the questions are, what does it take to do this kind of thing? Well then if, if they need to spray you know, hundreds of acres in a much shorter time period, I mean they can't spray all day, it has to just be the evening hours, then they need more equipment. She said we need more tractors then and we need tractors with headlights. They're going to have to reconfigure the machinery to be able to do some of this. <coughs> and they're worried because they're planting more and more almond acres, but um, the beehives are the number of hives available are reducing. So they're gonna they're kind of come up with a big problem very quickly. So even local growers here, if you can reduce the chemical use or not spray it when there's open flowers or bees will be visiting. Um, there's a program in Illinois called Drift Watch. If the applicator is going to be spraying, they can um, notify or you know, post it where they're going to be spraying. And then the beekeepers have a chance to do something with their bees. Although it will not be as simple as I had hoped. I hoped they could just put a door on the hive and keep them in. But they overheat. Um, you can net the hives. You can't. You, and you don't have time, or you don't have places always to move the hives to away from the sprays. So they're working on solutions, but even the ones that look like they'll you know, solve a big part of the problem, are, there's more things involved with it than that. Okay. So we want to help the pollinators in, in all of the systems. Okay. The thing I've handed, I've handed out, um, is a pollination assessment form, and I would probably encourage you to do this for your own individual <coughs> property, as well as different sites for, of the cliff top property, because the different sites are different ecologically, they're going to need different plans and different assessments. And your first assessment, you guys are way ahead of a lot of other people, you've already started your bio inventories. You know a lot of your plant list that you have there, You've already started the inventories on what insects you actually have there. <coughs> so you're way ahead of a lot of people. And, you're, and your habitat is much better than a lot of other people's already. You don't have as much um, agricultural or eroded systems as much. So you're going to get a higher score to begin with. So your change when you try to make changes won't be as big as some places. Some places when they took us out and we were looking at some of the places in um, Pennsylvania, they basically had 5% of native cover left. Um, it wasn't going to be very hard for them to make improvements quickly just by putting some native plants back in. So we'll go over this some more um, at the end, and we can walk through some examples. But that, that is one, one tool that they're giving people. Okay, so pollination. What do you think is your biggest pollinator in, in your area? All right, you get map choices. Butterflies, bees, flies, or, or beetles? Bees. Very good, bees. Yes, most people know that bees are the more efficient pollinators. Now, what they don't know is all the different nesting sites and, and the different things they need for habitat left. So when we're looking at um, honeybees versus native bees versus butterflies, they need different things done in the habitat um, to help them. Now the biggest thing people can do next to reducing chemical use is putting back the habitat. Or in your case, it will be preserving the habitat you have and, and doing some management things that increases the accessibility of it to some of the insects. 
Uh, one example of those right away is some of the insects like to live in stems. So if you have elderberries or bramble fruits on sections of your acreage, if you go by and nip the ends off, I mean, you don't have to do a low prune, you do a high prune, it opens a little stem area and leaves a little nest site available <coughs> for a little, little bee to come make a home. Okay? So we want to protect the pollinators. I was noticing this today. My windshield is much cleaner than it used to be. I mean, driving down the highway, now I, I just confess, 70 miles an hour, <laughs> I was bring a few miles over the speed limit, um, I didn't have a single splat on my windshield. I'm like, oh, this is not good. Mm -hmm. We should have enough insects flying about that we need to clean our greasy windshields a couple times a week. Okay? So it's not just the bees that are in trouble, it's everybody's in trouble. We've reduced the habitat and we've poisoned the habitat enough that they're all dying off. Now, entomologists like myself, all right, I keep telling people plant the habitat and they will come. Well, it's scary when I see newly planted habitats or two years down the road and they're still not filled with the insects I remember. So I'm a little scared that if we put it back in, we need to reduce the chemical use too to give them a chance to, to bounce back. I don't know if it's because this seminar was coming up, but I have seen more bees this year than I think ever. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> I just We were uh, deadheading our butterfly bushes this morning and just, uh, I mean, you said the no sound coming out of those hives. We had a constant hum. Yeah. Yeah. I like so. to hear that. Now in our area, um, up in northern Illinois, we, we have more bees this year, but our butterflies are way down. We have very few butterflies this year. A part of it could be the, the lack of water last year and, and, and lack of, um, yes, question? I noticed two days in a row where our butterfly bush was just filled with sparrows that quickly left when I came outside. My husband said they can eat the butterflies. Is that what? They can eat the caterpillars and they can eat the butterflies. Yes. So, so I don't know if I put a picture of Maggie in here. I think I did. Um, some of the die-hard butterfly protectors in our area are netting um, some of their bushes when they know they have a lot of caterpillars on them. And, and protecting the caterpillars till they can become a chrysalis, and, and so the more the butterflies can merge. Um, we put a children's garden in this year because there's a big disconnect with the little kids of never having to touch soil. Um, now we only got six families to come, but the one family is, is um, his parents are graduate students at the university, but they came from a city in India, so they have never touched dirt before. And so it's so funny to see him poke it. He's like, can I have hand sanitizer? His mom's like, you'll be fine. It's like, the first time he touched it, he asked for hand sanitizer right away. Um, and he got used to being in the garden and doing that. In fact, when we planted the little um, habitat food for the caterpillars, I put in fennel and dill and uh, <coughs> just for caterpillars. I had to leave a space in the asters and in the marigolds, because he stood there and waited for the caterpillars to come. And, and he, was, he was rewarded. One of them got little um, swallowtail eggs on it. So and he would just stand there for hours watching these caterpillars grow. And he came and ran and got me when, caterpillars are gone, caterpillars are gone. I'm like, they make chrysalises. He's like, oh, I thought the birds ate them. <laughs> so, in fact, he's taken some home. There's equipment now that school is starting. I'm going to have to retrieve from him and his parents because we need it for the other school kids. I'll let him take nets home and habitat cages, and and he would even come get food plants. He's like, I'm out of parsley, please. <laughs> give him a parsley plant. Give him a little dill plant. And um, so he had a he had a very good time. Now he'll probably be an engineer, but he'll like bugs. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to help the, the, our honeybees, but in helping the honeybees, we're going to help all the other insects as well. When I have different groups come to the Pollinitarium, they have a different focus. Um, I am not a die-hard native plant-only girl. In my um, area around the Pollinitarium, right out front, um, you can see it's all gravel. So I've put 
big, big planters out there, and they are mixed plantings. Uh, they have native perennials in them, and then annuals that will feed the insects nectar. So it's funny, we also had a fundraiser where I planted lots of basil, and people could make a donation to the Polynitarium and take a basil home. Well, a lot of them didn't sell. I had too much. Um, so but I let them sit on the table and go to bloom. Now this is where we're finding all our little native bees. So we're all standing at the table watching these bees that we don't even know what they are come in and trying to figure out how to get a good picture so we don't have to catch them to identify them. Now late in the season, once they're done making nests and everything, we probably will catch a few. But early in the season, I, I want to let them make as many babies and little bees as possible. So, so when they go to flowers, the bees get um, pollen, and for them that's a protein source and they get nectar to make in the honey, which is their carbohydrate source. Now when butterflies go, they only have a coil proboscis or straw-like mouth parts, so they're only nectaring. They are not normally eating the pollen. And some of the insects, um, some of the beetles in that, are just eating pollen sometimes. But those two food groups is what the insects are usually after. Okay, so our little honeybee girl. <coughs> I love when they they notice something, and you can actually literally see them turn and fly for it. It's like, oh, there's a, there's a flower. <laughs> so when she goes to the flowers, this is a late season picture because this is an aster. You can see on her <coughs> little legs. It's like, I have a honey I, I don't, I don't I remember to get this out until I need it. Ah. You can see on her little legs, that is called her pollen basket. So she will stuff as much pollen on there as she can to take it back to the hive. Now here's another thing you don't know about bees, or you probably you might. Um, honey is not bee puke, uh, which is what my second graders call it. Okay? <laughs> they have a honey stomach, which has a valve that, you know, what they, if they want to digest it, they can let some of the nectar go through. But they have a honey stomach where they carry the nectar back to the hive and spit it into the little honeycomb cells. So there's another little girl on a mission. Each plant has a different color pollen. I've only seen blue pollen once, and I have no idea which plant they got it from. I'm like, where did you get that? Um, usually it's pale yellow to golden orange. Um, come fall when the goldenrod is blooming, it's a nice golden yellow. But they also, when they bring that nectar in, it smells like stinky socks. People walk into the pollen and tear Now, when you walk up to a hive outside, you smell some. But since our observation hive is inside, we really smell it. In fact, our beekeeper, to assess our, bee, our health, the first thing she would do is open the door and put her nose in the air to see if she smelled any you know, diseases or decomposing bodies. They're not moving the bodies out fast enough. Um, but in the fall, when the school, just about when the school kids start, oh, that stinks. Why does that stink? They're like, it smells like, well, they, I don't shouldn't say some of what they say it smells like. Um, I call it sneaky socks. So. Okay, so they get the little pollen pellets. They actually use part of their little light parts and kick it off and put it into one of the cells. I cannot give you the actual demonstration. <laughs> when they, since they get nectar from different plants, when they dry it down, it has different colors, flavors, consistencies, different um, I mean, they get different vitamins and minerals from different plants, so they need a variety of foods to get the amino acids and the vitamins and minerals they need. They need a variety of plants. Okay, so when they're happy, this is our observation hive, and they're never 100% happy in this hive. We're always trying to help them out because they're not used to being in a single layer. They're not, their frames aren't next to each other. They can't make a normal cluster. But, um, our, our queen is not currently named. In the past, we've had them named Scooter, Queenie. I let the kids name them. And this year, the only names that have been proposed have been their own individual names. So Alyssa and Hannah and, um, have been proposed, but we haven't named her. for um, But she'll, she's, laid, she's laid eggs in these three frames. She had eggs in these three, and they only had honey in the top two frames. So our bees were in trouble. So I asked the beekeeper, which he in the past has never wanted to do, to take the glass off midsummer, and we gave them three new honey frames from a different hive. Well, they liked the honey, 
They don't like the old comb he gave them. They, they cleaned the honey out and they haven't touched these three frames again. So we're still in, in trouble of not having enough space. So we're going to pull these frames and give them some fresh wax frames. And I want to test these frames to see what the heck is in this wax that they won't use it. Um, so they need um, three to four acres of flowers normally. And they need to be able to fly in a two to three mile radius normally. Our bees do not have to fly far. We have our deer garden north of us. We have a Japan house garden not too far away. The student sustainable farm is right across the road the other way. Um, but even though we have all these flowers, there are times when nectar flow stops. We need different species of flowers um, and lots of them because even if the flower is open does not mean there's a meal sitting there. So we are trying to increase the number of species we have and the quantity we have. So when nectar flow stops on one, there will hopefully be something that they can pick up on the other. Our little prairie patch has way too much um, goldenrod in it. We need things from other times of year. So one of the things we're putting more in is um, the bee balm or the monarda. We have a lot of bumblebees. It's really funny to watch me in the spring with the spring classes. Because when the queens are hovering low on the ground and looking for a nest site, I'm running behind the little second graders. Don't step on her! Don't step on her! <laughs> it's like, don't pick her up! And um, so we, we, we've been fortunate that we have a nice um, nesting spots for bumblebees. Now one thing they're going to need, when, if you want ground nesting bees, you have to leave the nest sites. Honey bees live in trees, but a lot of our native bees nest in the ground. Now for honey bee, for bumblebees, they like bunch grasses and the bases of plants to get in and around. For some of the other solitary bees, you need to leave bare dirt. All right, I don't know how this started in North America, but bare dirt seems to drive people nuts. They want to cover it with mulch, they want to put a plant there, they want to put grass there. I'm like, leave it alone, it'll be fine. Um, sloping little hillsides they like, they like drainage. They don't want their baby sitting in water. So if you have, if you have a slightly sloped spot and, and, and there's a few plants, so they bare dirt in between them so there's not erosion, they like that. So leave some little bare dirt spots if you can. Um, my, my sisters are not very ecologically minded and, and they don't have very green thumbs. My, my youngest sister inherited my mom's house which sits in the woods and mom liked gardens but she had us do it for her because she didn't have a green thumb either. Um, so we put in, you know, blood root and all kinds of natives. Well, she naturally, she had four lots. The house sat on two, and then two were just woods and a little pond. On this slope, I have never seen a bigger patch of trout lilies anywhere. It was lovely. In the spring, we had, you know, half an acre of trout lilies. Well, when my sister inherited the property, she didn't like that slightly muddy look because when they're not there, you know, it looks a little muddy. She seeded the whole thing with grass. She's like, I didn't, I didn't dig them up. I'm like, it will out the grass will outcompete them. They'll be gone in a couple of years. Uh, I couldn't talk her out of it. I'm like, oh. That's all right. My brother-in-law doesn't believe me when I tell him a surfer flies a fly and not a bee either. All right, so this is one of our little natives. This is a little helicta bee. Um, a lot of the simpler bees sometimes like the nice open bowl-shaped flowers. This is a, um, one of the prairie roses, so um, nice, little, nice little roses. Oh, I already mentioned, you got to leave the bare dirt for the, for the ground nesting bees. Okay, so when you're planting, now if you guys are not just planting yards, you're planting natural areas. <clears throat> the first thing I would recommend do you, have, do you guys have neighbors that complain that it looks too scruffy and weedy? Do they give you grief over habitat looks? Okay, the city of Urbana writes me up every year. We stand in my driveway and have a discussion on it every year. So we're, we're having a, you know, the tango. So this year I made inroads. This year he made me cut all the chicory. I'm not allowed to have any chicory, any goldenrod. Um, he gave me a list of plants of nose. And, but if the chicory is not within 10 feet of the road, I can have it. Because that little helicted bee, they really like the morning flowers. 
and so the chicories open in the morning. So there's a few ch chicory plants further back in the yard now. In fact, this year he told me, you can plant the whole easement clear to the edge of the road as long as you find a plant that's under 10 inches. I'm like, done. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. So, so to make neighbors happy, it is sometimes nice to mow an edge for them and to have a tidy edge and sometimes a little fence for the prairie grasses to hit against, you know, at the, at the open edge is good because some, they tend to flop a little on their own. Um, today I was driving out of the Polentarium and looking left across the road and our prairie grasses are seeding themselves into the cornfield. I'm like, uh-oh, we might get in a little trouble over there. <laughs> so he, he, he probably will just mow it. So they're, they're getting a little used to us. Um, the arbor, we sit in the Arboretum on the campus and the, the first couple of years we're there, they wouldn't even add us to the map. I think they were hoping we were just a, a short-term thing and just going to go away. Well, this year, they, came, they actually had the board meeting at the Polonitarium, and then we walked out and looked at new planting sites. So we're putting new, some more pollinator pathways in. And, and I had a teaching pavilion little thing I'm going to put in the yard for the kids. When we have field trips and it starts to rain, we have nowhere for them to duck and run. So he even offered us an extra little patch of land to put our pavilion on. I'm like, Woohoo! <laughs> so, very good. So when you're planting, um, you're going to want to do it in larger swaths. You don't want to do little single, like single row tulip thing. You want to plant more in clumps. If you plant things um, like flowering bushes and flowering trees, that really helps. The, the, the strangest flowering time for a bush is witch hazel, which is really late fall. Um, so I would include some witch hazels. But some of my favorite honeys now are the tree honeys. So I would encourage I would encourage planting more of the flowering trees. And even you know, things things like tupelo. All right, tupelo is my favorite. Tupelo might not be the one you plant here, but I like tupelo. Um, and different sized bees have different sized tongues and can reach different flowers. So you're gonna to want to plant a variety of flower sizes as well as flower flower heights. Uh, any water source that you can have near the hive helps keep it clean. And I would, and if there's a water, if, the, if somebody, if the neighbor's putting a pool in, I would put some water source between them and that pool. They need water to um, ventilate and cool down their hive. So I was working with some future Farmer of America students in northern Illinois, and they were putting the hives at the back of the school, but within sight, there was a neighbor that had a pool. I'm like, okay, that's going to be a problem. They're going to, you're going to have bees in their pool. So they made a point of putting water in. Now, I haven't spoken with the kids yet. In fact, I'm going up to see how they're doing next week, probably. I'm wondering how many bees ended up in that pool and, and what they used for a water source um, to keep them from going there. But the water source then will help all the insects. Now, when we're speaking of water sources, I want to jump to butterflies for a moment. Butterflies sometimes form something called puddle clubs. And sometimes this is around where places where animals urinate. They go for the salts and things. But when you're giving insects water, you want it to be gravelly or a place for them to land where they're not going to drown. So if you put a bird bath in, you need to put rocks in it or something. Or you need a low trickling thing over rocks so they can land and get something to drink and be able to take off again. Now, some of my fa these are some of my favorite native plants. Um, Menarder, or bee balm. The hyssop. The milkweeds are more for the butterflies, for especially the monarch. Uh, wild indigo, purple coneflower. Joe pine weed is more of a fall bloomer. Penstemon is more of a spring bloomer. Spiderwort is another spring bloomer, and it's good for the margin between woods and prairie areas. Another um, one that's blooming now is ironweed. Okay. Now the prairie um, section of the Polonitarium, they started over 20 years ago, and it was meant to be a study site. Um, some very, now that I know more of the history on it, there are some cool things happening there. Um, we've added native plants to our yard, and we started beds in the yard where kids can come catch insects. This is where I must confess, 
where the kids are kind of swap at the plants with their little nets. I have planted some ornamental, more ornamental things and more herb things that can take a beating from an insect <laughs> net and, um, and attract a lot of insects. So this is what our prairie looked like. Um, now the, it has never looked like this again. The first year I came, they were nice, they mowed it for me, we had a burn. Um, we have not been able to coincide our permit time with our, the weather and our work crew time. So this year, um, it was too windy, it was too windy, and then all of a sudden, yoo-hoo, the conditions are right and we have a work crew. So we set a notice to the university people who were dashing out there to do it. They're like, sorry, your permit has expired. It will take you 30 days to get a new one. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So it has not been burned again. So we actually have walnuts and sumacs growing up. So we're going to do try to. Do, and this is what it looks like when it's when it's up. But this is one of the more early spring pictures. It's 20 acres. No, no. It's about one to two acres. Okay. 20 years old. Okay. And I now know it's more than 20 years old. It's, it's more like 30 to 40 years old. Now, when you're planting for bees versus butterflies, you need to think of two different things. Butterflies need food stages for two stages. They need, the adults need the nectar, and um, the caterpillars need leaf material. And I was doing this at a weird time, and when I'm thinking of caterpillar eating, I'm thinking, my juicy crunchies, my juicy crunchies. There was a, it's from a movie. It's like, don't mind me. Okay. Now the other thing that some insects don't have, another thing we do um, is we tend to mow and tidy. We tend to take away twigs, we tend to take away down trees. Do not tidy. Butterflies and caterpillars and other insects like um, cicadas need places to crawl up and, and have the chrysalis hang. And then once they come out, they need a place where they can hang so they can pump blood through their wings so they puff them out and they have time to dry. If they can't get up and can't get their wings puffed out, they will not be able to fly normally. They need the climbing spots. And they need the overwintering spots. So if the chrysalis is formed and is going to overwinter, it needs to be able to hang on that little piece of perennial plant until it comes back out in the spring. Some of them hang on the outside of the stem. Some of them will make, make get inside the stem. So the master gardeners, I'm, I'm a master gardener, but I'm a, I'm a rogue master gardener because I want them to change some of the practices. The master gardeners at the Idea Garden always have several weekends of fall cleanup where they just go down and cut all kinds of perennials down to a couple inches from the ground. I'm like, you're taking away the seed heads for the birds, all the echinacea you can leave and it can be seed heads. You're taking away all the stem sites for the overwintering insects. So you need to leave more because things will use it as, even if they don't attach to it, they can be under it and they can have cover. Um, sometimes you'll see ladybugs clustering in, in around bite bases of shrubs. You'll see other kinds of insects under little bark and leaves. You need to leave things so they have overwintering sites and they have protection. Okay. Now some, you guys, I'm a little jealous, you guys have more native plants that are available for the swallowtails, all the different species of swallowtails that we have. So um, you're going to want to leave and put in things like spice bush and pawpaw, and you're going to have more than one kind of swallowtail too. So this is the little caterpillar the Augustana was watching. So when um, swallowtails first cat come out, they look like little bird droppings. <laughs> And then as they're growing, they become the black and yellow and, and white striped. And if you poke them, they have a little Y-shaped thing <coughs> that smells like, smells like fruity tutti gum to me. Other people say it stinks. Um, so, but I think it's really cool. But it's basically like, back off. Don't eat me. Um, but the kids poke it so much that it just quits doing it, you know. <laughs> I'm like, Please, don't, don't pester the cat. Don't. <laughs> Okay, now sometimes, when, oh, I went too fast. Sometimes when they make the chrysalis, it's, it's going to be green, but most of the times when I've seen it, it's brown. So then it blends in with the dead or dying stems. Now 
that's, this is the one you see more commonly. Now, I want, I put this in because the swallowtails are the biggest and prettiest, but they are not the most numerous. You have um, things I would call little brown jobbies. There are tons of microlepidoptera, or little brown type of moths, um, that are outnumber, you know, the butterflies. Um, I'll have to get a, I'll ask Terry, who is a specialist on them, <coughs> give me a true number. Now tell me how many they are versus the butterflies. But you're giving habitat for the little things you don't see a lot as well. And you're giving habitat for the little butterflies. Now this plant, this speckled plant, um, is mountain mint. Now, only one year did I have, have, it, have these, the speckles be this dark. Usually it just looks like little white flowers. If I had you put one plant in your yard or garden that was a, a native, it would be mountain mint because it, it attracts the most number of orders of insects. It will feed wasps, it will feed flies, I've seen little beetles on it, and the little butterflies like it, little blues, little skippers. So I would put a mountain mint in, and it's funny, I keep saying this during talks at the Polonitarium, and I keep a big pot on the driveway. Well, this poor thing has now been divided down to four little stems left, because I kept giving pieces to people. So we'll have to let it regrow, and then I can... I, I, and I looked about trying to bring one down, like, well, I can't divide you again. So we'll have to bring this up next year. So that's again another one on the mountain mint. Okay, we are still having trouble with um, varmints. So, as I said, we're trying to increase the number of species in our prairie, and we have a well-established prairie, and I never see a deer in it. But uh, we now have put in plantings, I hate to say, one of our professors passed away, so, and he studied swallowtail butterflies, so the west side of the prairie, we're, we're augmenting the plants and making it a swallowtail garden. So we took out the goldenrod, and we keep putting in plants, and something is eating them. So, and we put an open fence like this around it. All right, this is not sufficient. The only, the only plants that lived were, we made cylinders of chicken wire, and you know, the thing couldn't, whatever it was, couldn't get down in there, and couldn't get up through it. So they raised the area again. So we'll have to try again and uh, go replant. But we are chicken wire individual plants this time. So when you put things in, if you really want it to survive and give it a chance, you, you might have to chicken wire it for a couple years um, in established areas. What is it, what is it that they're eating? They ate everything. So we put in we put in purple cone flower, we put in pale purple cone flower, we put in spiderwort. Um, Milkweed, we put in milkweeds, and they ate them. Um, we put in like 10 species, they ate every one of them. You don't know what's doing this? I don't know what's doing this. My guess is, is a combination of deer, rabbit, all right, we, we never had a groundhog in our area at all. We put in the children's garden, and the kids and I are walking to the garden, and we have to go past the little wooded area, and this thing comes barreling towards us, and the kids are like, and it's like, it's a groundhog. It's not just a groundhog. It's a moose truck groundhog. Um, so the groundhog has now moved into our prairie. In fact, we had to rope off the hole so the kids don't step in it. Um, and so, but we also have deer. So our choices are rabbit, deer, groundhog. And our other problem is dog. Um, we, we have a lot of walkers and a lot of dog walkers. And... And they tend to like to come to our place because it's not city property. They let them off leash, mm -hmm. but then they, but then they, um, they trample the new plantings. They're as bad as my dog. I don't bring my dog to work because she has no plant sense. I'll, I'll dig a plant. She'll like that I'm digging in the dirt, and she'll come over and sit on it for me. I'm like, get up, honeybee. Her name was not originally honeybee. It was honey bear. She looked like a little bear cub. But she didn't answer to that. She was at the Polonitarium. She was there when she was a puppy. And I said, Bee. And she came running. I'm like, your name is Honey Bee, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, are you planting exclusively in the springtime? No. So um, <coughs> one, reason, one reason we're getting the plant of pathways is that a student group got a grant to do it for on campus. And they're supposed to do it in, a, in, a, in association with the housing 
department and put it in front of the dorms <coughs> and, and student housing and things. No, I mean, are you planning, are you doing your planning only in the spring? No, we're going to do $6,000 worth in a couple weeks. Okay. And, and, and that's one reason they came to us was the housing pulled out. They got worried about putting all this where they were putting it. And so that now they have all these plants and nowhere to go. And they do need to go in quickly <coughs> so they can develop some roots and, and make it through the winter. Well, um, they, but, they may get a chance to establish over the winter without being eaten. Yes, but, but since we've done this twice in our own prairie, we, I've warned them that it has to be fenced or chicken wired when we put it in. So we were out picking out spots to put it in. And now we're working on permissions because it touches six different um, groups that we have to, everybody has to concur. So, and I told them if we can't get agreement, that we will just take part of the children's garden, which is just annual vegetables. We can rip out some of the vegetable rows, get the plants in so they can overwinter. They won't, they're in little three and four inch pots. They won't survive the winter in the four inch pots. Yeah, so, planning uh, everything from pots in right into the prairie? Um, we were given some seed, and we, and, and we have pots. So we're going to scratch in some seed when we put the plugs in. Yeah. We have a surplus. I got a six acre prairie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, where I'm getting my plants, there's a there's a volunteer group called Grand Prairie Friends. So, a botanist from the Natural History Survey, he goes around to the state prairies and gathers local seeds. So the genetics is is all for the area, and he sprouts them in, and they sit, they have a spring plant set. And so that's where I bought plants from them this spring. And um, and where I they at? huh? Where are they at? They're, they're, they're in Champaign Urbana, Champaign. and I. The Polynitarium doesn't have enough funding for me to have a full-time job there. I'm only half-time. So my other half-time job is I'm running the greenhouse for the survey, so I know that they have plants left. <laughs> like, there's plants. There's plants that need homes. Grand Prairie uh, Friends is an all-volunteer group just like Clifftop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, also a very good, very busy group. And unfortunately, we have to charge them university rates to have their plants in the greenhouse. So I feel bad every time I have to write them an invoice of, and how much it is. It's like, so they, their, their plants are worth the three bucks a pot. Okay. Come on. This is when you tell the computer, don't freeze up. <laughs> now some of the teachers and the individuals were encouraging to um, put enough milkweeds in that they can be a monarch way station. So for the monarchs, the monarchs are going to be impacted even harder in some ways than the bees. Because they have to migrate so far, they need nectarine sites the whole path of what they normally fly. And we're making the nectarine sites smaller and smaller and further and further apart. So sometimes when they settle for the night, they, they're not finding food plants or enough nectar to get them enough strength and get them down to Mexico or back up from Mexico. So we're encouraging people to put in, I think to be to get the monarch way station sign, you have to have two species of monarch or milkweeds and 12 of each. So Maggie is our, our, our butterfly master naturalist guru. So she raises monarchs. She's one of these that bags them and doesn't let the other things eat them. And um, look at her. She's, she's letting it um, come out on her hand, dry its little wings, and she'll sit there long enough for it to do that. Will they um, feed on other plants? The adults can nectar on other plants other than milkweeds, but the caterpillars need the milkweed leaves right. to grow. Okay. So for the, for the adults, we have all kinds of other nectar plants we put in. So this is Maggie, happy with her little critter. When she came to talk the middle of the summer, she'd only seen two monarchs the whole summer. And same with me. And one of them settled on one of the milkweeds out front in one of the pots, and I waited and I waited and I waited until it flew away. It didn't lay a single egg. I was like, oh. so very few eggs in our neighborhood this year. Now, one of the things they like in the fall is Joe Pie Weed. And this one, this is called Butterfly Weed. So if you would like a tidy native perennial, this one stays shorter than the other milkweeds. And you can see it has a nice fine um, leaf compared to the others. So a more ornamental look. So if you want to sell it to your neighbors, sell them the, um, this one. 
And if your farmers are afraid of it getting in their fields, this, this is not a, a weed one like the others. She even has her husband getting into it. She makes him go release the little monarchs and put them on the plants. And then she invites the kids to come. Because it's very cool for them to feel the flutter, you know, and the walking of little feet on their hands. And I never get them to sit on my hand that long. It's usually like, I'm like, well, I didn't get to hold you much. Um, but like this one little girl that walked on her hand, walked up on her shoulder, sat on her nose. Um, I don't have the picture of it sitting on her nose, so I have to get that one. Okay. So the big mission is to protect our friends. Now, I know I'm kind of rambling, so now I have to check my notes and see what I did not say that I wanted to especially make a point of when I was talking. Okay, so definitely reduce the chemical use or use it wisely if you're going to use it. Bees fly during the day. Don't apply it near flowers or on flowers. Um, if you're putting in a pollinator strip, um, oh, that's one thing I did not mention. I went to the um, NRC, is it NRCS? I went to their office, their state office, and talked to the gentleman because you can plant pollinator strips as part of conservation acres. And so I wanted his plant list from him, what they were recommending for people in the state. And he's like, he's getting very few people that are actually signing up for it or even asking for the plant list information. So if you call their office and want to put your strips into pollinator acres, um, I have contacts from Penn State and from other places where they're doing a lot of it, and I can work with you to come up with a plant list. Now part of it will be on seed sources. So part of my history is after I finished my master's here, I went home and organic farming for a while before coming back to do the PhD and, and the pollinitarian bit. So when we put wetlands in, we used Ernst. So Ernst is in um, Pennsylvania. So his genetics, he gets some of the seed from people here. Um, but we can, there's another one suggested on the Xerxes site that is called Prairie, I think Prairie Nurseries. So there are nurseries that sell local, more locally genetic stock. So I would suggest Grand Prairie Flames for plugs or little plants. And then I would suggest talking to people, finding the seed sources will be the thing. And some of the people are going around and collecting the seed and then just selling it um, by weight. And, and so part of it depends on what you can afford, um, what acreage you want to cover, and, and what species you're interested in. Um, on the Clifftop website, uh, under science, the conservation home is a list of the native plants of your area to include 14 species of milkweed. And on that same website are three more or less local seed sources. Are they all Missouri? One's Missouri, two are Illinois. Okay. When I was searching, I found um, one Illinois and three Missouri. Yeah. Well, uh, up in the uh, Litchfield area, Henry Eilers, you know Henry? I don't know Henry. And Blue Stem Nursery. Blue Stem, Blue Stem I know. Anyway, our website has the plants that belong here and where you can go find seed for. Yes, and I would, if you want a, um, a good show of something, I would recommend the seed um, mixed with some plugs or some potted things. It, I don't know, it just makes me happier faster if, if I see something coming up and can recognize that the spot is filling in with something. Um, from our experience in Pennsylvania when we did it, the first site we did, we put the grasses and the forbs in at the same time. Our grasses overtook our forbs. So the next time we did it, we actually put the forbs in first and came back and did um, putting grasses later. Um, I would recommend one other thing for anybody who's considering a little native prairie garden, and that would be to stay with shorter grasses um, don't go with switchgrass or Indian grass. Um, or big blue stem. Well, even big blue, blue stem can be a takeover. Take, knock out all your flowers. Yeah. yeah, big blue stem is what's jumped the road and is growing in the cornfield now. So our website has a list of native to this area for shorter grasses and sedges. 
that a lot of people don't play with at all and are much easier to work with. <coughs> okay. Now, I think I said this already. I would not put your pollinator or wildlife strips along treated fields only. I would want it against the, the woods or against the road, um, just where it's not going to have impact of some of the some of the treatments. And your mowing. Do you guys mow with a brush hog or the regular mower? I'll just do it differently. Depends on how much acreage. Okay. We request that you mow higher and let some of the lower growing things actually bloom. Now this is I'm usually the men in the audience um, when I'm talking about lawns want to kill me when I want clover and dandelions and things to, to bloom to feed the bees. But you can also, and, all right, and I don't like no-mo zones where they have, um, just let whatever was already there grow up. <coughs> the no-mo zones that they, they have not planned and planted tend to be very weedy. So if you want a no-mo zone on some of these websites that I was perusing, they actually have different height mixes. So you can have a low meadow, a mid-height meadow, a high meadow. You can get different blooming heights and different growing heights. Um, so your no-mo area can be look more of the way you want it to, but then you'll be feeding more things. And now, so another thing about mowing is um, our, our, the person that mows our area around the pollinarium is also our beekeeper. So he usually doesn't have much time, so that works out really well. Because in our yard, we have a lot of plantain. Plantain is a native host plant for buckeye butterflies. So when you're mowing, you're also chopping up insects. And you're killing them and, and cutting down their homes. So if you let things grow more, the caterpillars and things can come to um, full development. And there'll be more food plants for them. So not just, not just letting things bloom, but having an area to grow and much leaves is another thing that they're looking for. Okay, I wanted to mention Ernst, you already mentioned the ones on cliff top, and I wanted to mention curry seeds. A lot of the um, information things and places I'm going for, for um, information, and the place I got your handout we're going to talk more about now, is Xerces Society. Their whole um, mission is invertebrate conservation. And they have all kinds of, you have to peruse and click quite a bit, but they have all kinds of information on seed list, and they do it by region, <coughs> by state. My <coughs> choice, though, for, for you guys, you're going to have to go between two main regions because some of the good information was listed with um, the states south of you um, on their website. So the information for this site is not in just one area. You're going to have to move around to get the, get the good information. Okay. Okay. That's all my main points. Uh, questions? Can I keep rambling then a little bit? I guess uh, not so much as protecting the bees, but you were mentioned in 2006 there was something that that was killing the bees. Was that a virus or what was that? I didn't catch. So, in the studies they've done trying to figure out what colony collapse disorder is, it is not one thing affecting them all the same way. So basically we've reached a tipping point where things have added up together to bring down a lot of the insects all at once. So just like us, they need a safe house. So things like don't cut down the perennial stalks, um, don't take down the trees, the honeybees will live in the trees. Um, so leave, leave the houses for them. They need um, enough food. We've replaced almost all the native flowering things with grass lawns, roads, houses. We've taken out most of the habitat for, for Illinois, if you really look at it. I mean, there's still things growing there. It still looks pretty green when you look around our state, but we've taken away all the, all the food plants and all the house sites. Um, so they need clean food, clean water. Uh, clean water, even for our humans, is like, yeah, right. Um, we have soaps in it. We have chemicals in it. Um, everything, everything is downstream, and 
we as long as well as the bees in that are drinking water that has a lot of things in it now. I mean, when I talk to the school kids, we even go into what do you what did you bring your lunch in? How much plastic do you go through every day? Well, can you bring a little glass dish with a rubber, rubber lid? You now, can you reuse things? Um, we, we talk more about it's not just reducing our carbon footprint, reducing our chemical footprint. What can you use that doesn't put extra stuff out there every day? And um, it's like the, the laundry detergents. If you go to the creek behind the laundromat, you know, all the foamy, sudsy, we use way too much, you know, it's way too strong. Um, so changing your chemicals that you're clean with even will, will help them. So food, house, water, um, safe fly zone, not, not being whacked with things, not having to fly across an interstate to get to their flower patch. Um, yeah, it was, it was a nice fox on the way down. I always have the urge of, oh, I want to stop. Um, <laughs> um, so safe, safe areas for that. Now, unfortunately, just like we get new diseases, they get new diseases. And the way we move bees around, including bumblebees, we are spreading their diseases the, the natural for them and that they can keep up with. So Varroa mite was a new mite in the 90s, um, and the problem with it is it sucks their blood. Now we now know that when they're sucking their blood, just like mosquitoes pass malaria, the Varroa mite are passing them new viruses. And when they looked at some of these viruses, um, if it was a healthy hive, they had all the food they needed, you know, no other diseases, it was killing 85% of the hive. If the bees were already weakened um, because they had another disease or they weren't getting good food, some of these new viruses can kill up to 99% of the hive. And these have been here longer than we knew. So then they went back to the freezers and started pulling samples from before this first discovery, and they found it. It's been building in, in different places. And the mites move it around, the trucking of the bees moves it around. Um, beekeepers tend to be very friendly, jovial people and want to help you out as much as they can. When we have the farm in Pennsylvania, and I did things wrong, this is the first one, I'm cleaning out the barn, there's hives, let's use them. Um, I did the burn them. <laughs> I, but I Lysoled them, <laughs> and apparently I didn't rinse one of them well enough because when we inserted the, um, the, the packages, the one absconded right away. I call, I'm allergic, so I have to keep with a partner. So I call my beekeeping partner, Charlie, Charlie, I think they're swarming. What's it look like? Well, there's a diffuse mass over the hive, there's a bunch in the apple tree, but it's kind of a diffuse cloud. He's like, nah, you're wrong. He comes back after work, opens a hive, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's like, they, they, they absconded. So we did not prepare the hive to their liking, and they were out of there. Um, our other problem in Pennsylvania were bear. So we put the remaining hives up next to the, the sunflower field, and, uh, and a bear got the one. So we were, my brain's like, we had three at that point. So the, we split the one eventually, and had, still had three. And um, we were moving the hives down near the pigs, because the bears don't like the pigs. Um, <laughs> and um, it did work. We put it between the house and the barn and fenced the pigs along it. And the bears didn't touch them again. And um, well, some of the pigs were bigger than the bears. Because I also keep pigs like I keep bees. I let them stay a long time. I find them alternative jobs if I can. <laughs> I, I had a radio personality pig, a petting zoo pig. I had three of them living in the house with me at one point. It's like, well, their mama died, and they needed fed every two hours. So if you're in a cast iron tub, you can hear when they get up. <laughs> uh, I guess my, my ex-husband did put up with that for a while. <laughs> that a lot of things are impacting them to be healthy. Um, so now I recommend to all new beekeepers, do not accept old equipment for somebody. Burn the old boxes. Um, we've had some diseases in our area that, yeah, I wouldn't. In fact, I, I belong to the Eastern, I can't always remember the 
the initials, Eastern Illinois Central Something Beekeepers Association. And I, I won a raffle, and they gave me a bottom board. And when they handed it to me, I'm like, it's a little dirty. Is this used? <laughs> They're like, no, no, it was just sitting in the barn, never used. I'm like, okay, thank you. <laughs> but right away, it's like, if it was used, I don't want it. And, uh, yeah, because, and, and, but they, they try to save money. So they burn part of the stuff, but not all the stuff. It's like, no, no, just burn it. And, and they, well, they charred the inside of the boxes with blowtorch. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'd still recommend a new clean wood box. So all my newbie graduate students, yeah, we, we are shopping for what, what best wood to get. And, and we're arguing over 8 frame versus 10 frame. Some of us more wussy ones want a smaller hive, easier to pick up. Um, do you have any top bar hives? Um, some of the people in town do. I'm not into the top bar because I can't harvest the honey without killing the babies. Um, or at least I don't know how. So, huh? I, I don't think if you destroy it, you do that. That's so, that's, that's just so, so with a regular hive, you can put it in a, in a street, a queen excluder. So she can't get up there and lay eggs in your, in your honey frames. Well, and a lot of new beekeepers are overwhelmed too. So we actually got a donation at the Polynitarium last week of frames filled with honey because they didn't know how to extract it. And they'd let it sit too long so it had started to crystallize. So when they did try to spin the first one out and they didn't have um, support wires in the comb, so it, it broke out of the frames when, it, when they were trying to spin it. So it became an, an experiment of showing and working with the graduate students of, well, let's try different ways to do this and see what we can get. And there's still a pile of comb sitting there that people are just <laughs> picking at a little. It's like, and um, some of it we deemed, um, they did have uh, wax worm. So right away we were, were freezing, freezing frames. And um, yeah, so. We just had this. Huh? We lost the whole body. Yeah. So the pests are moving around. It's funny, we have the observation hive so we can see when they move in. So we, we did not give the research hive small hive beetle. The research hives gave us small hive beetle. And when he brought us a hive this year, um, we now do not have a hive that doesn't have any small hive beetle in it in our little area. So when he brought our new hive and he was putting the frames behind the glass, well, some of them get out. And they, we have a room that has windows so I see bees bouncing against the glass, and she has a small hive beetle in her mouth. She's trying to get get rid of it, and she doesn't, you know, she's bouncing against the glass. I'm like, let her out, let her out. <laughs> she's getting rid of the beetles. And, uh, and once they're behind the glass, you see them chasing them down. And um, I banned any frames from my hive that are the plastic, because they have those extra um, indentations and what you call ribbing to make it strong. The hive beetle can hide in there, and the bee bees can't reach it to grab it and throw it out. So I see them run and dive in there, and then they can't get it out. So we have just wood frames in our hive now. And um, but we learn something every year. It's like now the three frames he put in there, they won't won't fill it back up with babies or or nectar. I'm like, we're pulling those again because I don't know what's in that wax. I know where my stuff is coming from is all from the same pool. But individual hives can have different problems. And, and we are low, low hive on the totem pole. Um, we are just get the remainders because he has to keep the research hive stronger. So usually when we get bees, it's because something has happened that they no longer know the genetics of the hive or the queen died. And so like the hive that came, he was trying, they were trying to use it for research. But when they opened it, the original queen was dead and there was a... Um, a virgin queen's in her, in her little cell. So he brought me that hive. And they kind of rushed her along, took her out of her little cell, painted her, put her in our hive. <laughs> they put her in with the dot wet. So her workers cleaned off the dot. So when he gave us three new frames, he repainted her. He said, there you go. And, and I was I'm like, well, is she going to figure it out? Is she going to find drones? She found drones. She's laying plenty of eggs. This hive doesn't make enough honey. These this queen makes way more eggs than they make honey. So he said um, he would be willing to take that glass off again and put more honey frames back in. So we don't have ways to give them extra frames to make extra honey because it's behind the glass. So all we can do is give them honey frames then from a different hive. And my beekeeper's argument in years past was, 
well, they, they, they need to know, figure out how to make their own honey because that, that's not fair to another hive to take honey off of them. I'm like, well, in good years, I'm like, give them the honey. So this year, he's willing to open it three extra times. I'm like, yay! See, I can't do this myself because I'm allergic and the university says I have to stand behind the window when I'm watching him do this. It's so funny. I go running into the little side door, throw comments in, shut the door. And <laughs> say, <laughs> oh, Jordy, Jordy! So, walkie talkie. Huh? Walkie talkie. We don't, the, it, the, they didn't build the room with an intercom. But oh, yeah, we, we could get walkie yeah. talkies. Then you wouldn't have to. <laughs> oh, but they weren't flying that much. And I've kept bees. I mean, it's like, I actually haven't been stung since I was seven. I may not be allergic anymore. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it and find out. Yeah, I don't blame you. So, do you carry up a pen? Yeah. All the time at work or? All the time at work. I don't carry them with me out in public all the time. But at work, they're in the medicine chest, in the pie chest, and in my purse. So, well, because we have a lot of kids come too, and you never know if they're going to be or not going to be. Right. So, um, but they usually come with their own signed form, their own EpiPen. And Matter of fact, for students visiting, do you have some kind of a link or some kind of form that they need to know in advance? just because of the concern of allergies? Or? Um, usually it's an individual school, an individual teacher basis. But in the fall, we have every second grader from the Champaign School District come. So they, ahead of time, let the parents know. And so then if there is a child with a known allergy, then they come with a signed permission slip, and they come with their own EpiPen, and with an aide or a teacher that knows how to administer it, or the child's been given training on their own. And they make us take um, training. So we have to do the little, you put it here, you make the clicky, and um, yeah, they make us take the, re renew our EpiPen training. So you can, you're used to the feel, what it should feel like when it, when it actually goes in. So. Is there any talk of any form of guiding regulation regarding the use of particularly native bees, like bumblebees, as green, greenhouse workers? Um, because I've read that they're being used in greenhouses and then they're back into the wild and there's been a lot of disease transmission. Um, there was discussion about that at this conference and there, there, there's a, bee, a bumblebee specialty <coughs> group that will discuss it some more. And they think the diseases were brought in because they, they tried to rush and bring extra bumblebee packages in for the tomato crops. It's funny, one of the graduate students I took to the conference <coughs> studies bumblebees. Her whole goal is to want, end up working for one of these companies one day so she can make sure they're um, doing all the disease control they can. There are not specific regulations, so some of this stuff, it is an honor system, you know, do your best you can, and um, they're, they're not being screened for some of it. So, there's not screening the whole, the whole way along. Mm -hmm. Would you entertain a town question? Yes. I live in a town <clears throat> right in the middle of the town. And I've been looking in my yard. Um, I've always thrown white clover seed in. And I thought, why am I you know, paying some kid to mow this grass all the time? I've been thinking about turning the whole lawn into Dutch clover. Do you think? Um, I've never seen a solid Dutch clover. I've only seen Dutch clover mixed with other things. Ah. Um, does anybody know why that is? Is that white clover? It's a yeah, it's white. a white clover, yeah. It's about sure. four or five inches tall. Um, we got a trend years ago, you always put white clover in your lawn. Nowadays you use weed killer and kill it. Yes. I, I like, I, I have, a, my, I have dandelions lines and white clover and everything else in there, but so for questions I don't know, we can write them down and I can dig up answers. So what I'll probably do is check with Ernst or one of the other growers um, if, if, if the if solid white clover um, yeah, or patch heck, works. I, I wouldn't care. Mm -hmm. And and the and the one the one nursery had a low growing um, cover, so I would check if there's something that they they put in their low growing cover that could go with the white clover. So if you write that down, I'll, I'll check for it. Yes, anybody else want to call for questions? Uh, I just want to comment. The uh, August 19th Time magazine had
had a feature article, A World Without Bees. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that yet. I saw the cover. Excellent, excellent article. Ah, okay. Well, that, that was about the same time we were at this conference. And so someone actually uh, threw that up on their slide. Everybody said, oh, we can do that yet. So. I just wanted to make a comment. I, Coon and Carl and Cooktop have had these Meet the Neighbors, which I have just loved. And I like liking the furry things and the feathery things. And the, I saw the pollinators on the year, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, bees, stinging things, biting them. And, uh, but I loved your, you. I loved your presentation, but I read this book. I can't think what it's called. Bringing the natives home. Bringing nature home. It is a great book. But it, and I'm a prairie freak. And uh, and anyhow, uh, when I read that, it was about. And I've got prairies. I'm trying to do a five-acre prairie now. That I'm really frustrating with. But you know, I've always been working with this. And that book. I mean, basically, what it got down to was. If you don't have the pollinators and the insects, the whole rest of the stuff this doesn't is crash. Wow. And uh, so I'm to land stuff. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'd recommend it to anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would too. It's bringing nature home. Yeah, it's really good. George is George. Doug. Doug Tolandi. I think it's Tolandi. T A L L A M Y, I believe. We have some books that is the paper that it is not very Is it paper that it's really good? Excellent, excellent book. I guess my best advice to to people to go along with what Leslie has told us. And it doesn't matter if, like, at the Dell, you've got a garden in the city or yeah, got expensive that's what acreage saying. in the country. Yeah. You really can make a difference right. for the whole uh, yeah. ecosystem exactly. because insects fly, birds fly, things mm -hmm. move a lot. It may seem like you've got these tiny little islands, mm -hmm. but when we have chains of islands, right. we have an well, I've heard the city kids even links. put little zinnia pots on their balconies. Yeah. And it, it, it makes linkages. And then in terms of growing bird food, and Carl will tell you I'm a real bird brain. Um, <laughs> now, now we do not have bird houses grow at the Palantarium. <laughs> so they don't eat the bucks. Yeah. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they, they eat all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, we, we do not put nesting bird boxes. One woman wanted to come put lots of them up. We thanked her and we said, we'll keep more bugs at the moment. Yeah, it, you know, you have to try to find a variety and a balance. I mean, you mentioned chicory, which I think is a gorgeous flower, and I only, always admire it when I see it along the roadsides, but I try very hard to keep it away from my prairie plantings because Yes, we do not put chicory in our native mass. plot. I let it in my yard, which is a weed, was a weedy thing to begin with. I got my little house, and I was so excited. I'm like, ooh. I waited for spring to see what came up. Not a single thing. <laughs> they round up the whole yard twice, make it look tidy for selling. Um, so I let it go for, you know, I haven't put anything else on it. And now things like um, Solomon Seal is back up. And so some things have recovered. But they round up the whole yard just to make it look good. I'm like, ah. Oh. Yes, I have um, neighbor wars. We share a driveway. He's Mr. Roundup. He uses, what are those pumper things? He uses like five of those pumper things a summer. And, um, and some things I, that I grow in the driveway, I don't actually eat because I know they get hit. He's actually killed half a mulberry tree because he hit it with so much herbicide so many years in a row. I'm like, oh yeah, kill a tree with herbicide. It's like, <laughs> so. Yes. He found a way. <clears throat> he found a way. It is still not coming down. It's going to get twinkle lights. Um, I'm leaving my dead tree up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stubborn girl sometimes. Good habitat. Huh? Good habitat. Good habitat. Yep. Because I think the U of I overdues it on the <laughs> yeah, the, it's funny. The Arboretum people and I are working that out. They've offered to come help me some. And um, I've let them do the Russian thistle. I said they can have the Russian thistle, all the honeysuckle they want, um, the buckthorn, 
there were five plants we agreed on that they could come take away. Um, like, well, you can have all that you want. And I had a bird up next to the door, and because the bees really like it, so I was going to let the bees eat. And before it made those little, you know, velcro-y seed pods, I was going to cut it down. Um, so several people made an official complaint to my department head um, about the noxious weeds I was letting grow at the colonitarium. And so she came out to check on me. She's like, it's feeding the bees. I'm like, yeah. And I'll take it down as soon as it's done blooming. Um, but, uh, there was enough outcry that I cut the one down next to the front door and left the one at the back row. Um, so we are trying to strike a balance and make people happy halfway in between them. So. Are there any guides that you can recommend for identification of native bees, wasps, or are they all really specialist? All I have found has been really specialist. So, in this series, and it's funny, somebody's borrowed my butterfly ones. I have two butterfly ones. In this Natural History Survey series, which you know is incomplete. Yes. Um, they have silk moths, they have skippers, they have sphinx moths, and they have butterflies. There's supposedly somebody working on the dragonflies and damselflies, and on the bees. So, but I think the bees one's going to take a while. But they're working on, on some for those as well. But they, like I said, they will not be complete. These will be starter packages. There's so many species. Um, and, and the entomologists that fill these things out are in every county with, for the same amount of time. Um, some counties they spend a lot of time in, other counties they don't spend a lot of time in. So you're, you should start, use these as a starter checklist and then, and then add to them. There is a very good caterpillar book yeah. by Princeton University. Yes, yeah. and I am not a good immature person. I usually go to Jim Nardi for that, and we have a person called Terry Harrison, who's very good on the Lepidoptera. It's funny though, you have to have a good enough picture or a specimen to show him. And so the kids and I, when we were finding caterpillars we didn't know, we were putting them on the little host plants we found them on, and then putting them in little cages, and calling, and calling Terry. Well, the cages we have are meant more for butterflies, apparently, because they've chewed holes through our little cages, <laughs> and, and, and then ran off and pupated in the, in the pulmonotarium. And, it's like, and some of them have emerged in the pulmonotarium. So two weeks after this little rogue caterpillar, it got out of the cage, and then dropped to the table it was sitting on, and I had a nice um, honeybee tablecloth I've made. It chewed holes through this tablecloth trying to get away. It's like, oh, Gabby, why didn't you just... And I put soil in it to, you know, for pupate. I mean, you're, you're supposed to drop to the soil, pupate, and be happy. Um, <laughs> but they have a wandering phase. So they go trying to find a really good place to make the chrysalis or the pupate. And, um, but this one did come out eventually. So part of it is, if we don't know what it is, we, we try to make it, let it become an adult so we can then identify it. So you can either take pictures, and I can get Terry to try to help us, or we can, or, or growing up is the biggest thing. And that's Augustia, that's his big thing. That's why he's always coming to ask me for food plants. He's trying to raise as many caterpillars as he can. Although his favorite is cabbage whites because that's what he has the best luck with. The pipe vine's cool. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and the spice bush, he has those all in the Carol our butterfly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you find some, you can't. If you, if you take pictures, we can try to do that. Um, same with bumblebees. Oh, I didn't talk about that. Now, I could not find my box. I have, I have student helpers at the Palmetarium, and when I stopped to get my bumblebee sheets, I couldn't find them. We have bumblebee sheets um, that identify the species that are in Illinois and Missouri. So if you want to buy some of these, I think it cost us two, like two and a quarter to print them. Um, I can send you a batch down after I find them. But you can tell the different species by the colorations of the, uh, that's on the bees. And the boys, the boys have a little yellow square on their face. And um, um, 
I've picked some up that I thought were boys and I need to look closer sometimes. Um, uh, but I noticed quick enough to go, oh wait, go away. I'm telling you, I don't need to hold you. <coughs> so we, we do have bumblebee guides. We do not have a, na a native bee guide. Although there is um, several students working on native bees now, so we should be getting more information on that. And some of the things they encourage. So I mentioned cutting off the cane fruits um, to leave little housing areas. You can also cut off um, elderberries is another good one. Now in our area, we've been making little bamboo houses. I would not use a closed can like this because if you set it at an angle and rainwater gets in, it will fill up. So if you use a can to hold it, you have to punch holes in it so the water gets out. Did I bring you in a little one? Oh, it did not stay in the box. We had some plastic sleeves that they fit in nicely. Now the thing is, you cannot, some of the kids bundled them with twine and then hang, hung them from a tree, but bees don't like a moving house any more than the birds do. So um, fixing them like in the crotch of a tree or to a post or something uh, worked much better. And we actually had people get bees in there, um, but then they were sad um, when other insects attacked or ate the larvae. So even if you get them, they don't always make it all the way. I've been using Fang Mighty. It's hollow. It's a hollow stem and I don't like bamboo. Oh, that'd be good. All you have to do is just cut the stems. And you can get one end solid. And you have the other end open that works out, and you get some really good. Ah, very good. Got to try it my thing by anyway. So. <laughs> and we we tried another type of house. We tried where they nailed um, four by six together and then drilled different size holes. We have not had bees move into those as much as we had bees move into the different bamboo pieces. When straws work too. Straws work too. And in fact, at the conference we were at. They, they suggested straws more than other things, because if you have a permanent house that never gets cleaned out, you eventually get diseases. So they liked the straws because they were more, um, let them have them for a season, throw them away, and then get fresh ones, and then you don't have any disease build up. How about between uh, paper straws and, and um, plastic straws? Um, they preferred the paper. Paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. More natural. Well, if anyone is interested in honeybees, we actually would love to help them get started. We have actually a business where we help people get started and oh, right good. here in Honor County um, for any questions. And please bring your kids to the Pumpkin Fest on the 12th, which you already have a hilltop event that day, but um, I'll be speaking to the children and we'll have our observation hive and, and things there so people can actually see what um, hive you know, looks like some people haven't seen actually. Yeah, that, that's very yeah, cool. So it's kind of interesting. Is this a Waterloo? Yes, for Waterloo. Yes, the Waterloo Pumpkin Fest on the 12th. Yeah, yeah it's at the courthouse. Well, you can put things next to it. Hi. You know, we'll have to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Make it timing. Maybe yours will be later or something. But, um, do you have, you have any other local bee things you want to throw in? If you do have hives, don't treat. We try to do everything naturally, and we think that the more people treat, the more the species can't resist, you know, the... Now, do you use a screen bottom board for the yeah, mites in the summer, and yeah. then switch back to a solid for winter? We actually design ours with slide-in uh, So we can take it in drawer. Okay, okay. We can slide a piece of lumen on underneath in the wintertime. And that allows us, when we do treat for the beetle and we hard sugar them, we can just pull that right out, clean that, discard that, put that right back in. So we just encourage people to let them be beasts. <laughs> let them do their thing. Let them do their thing, you know. And we can monitor them and we watch them. And yeah, the beekeepers that I associate with don't like that we didn't treat ours with anything in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Some people don't like that. They give it. Like, yes, like, they some will die. That. I'm like, yes, yeah, some will die. Well, no, I told we had a great year. It's like, we got 50 pounds of honey off a hive. It's like, it was okay. So we're, we're here if anybody has any questions because we're wanting more people to own bees. And, you know, and Are I, you listed in the business have, pages at all? Oh, I am. We're, our business is called the, the Picky Bee. It's called what? Bee, the Picky Bee. Um, and we're listed in the, 
than the book. I'm not too, too much more registered with We belong to St. Clair Bee Association. Um, and our hives are registered. Now, who, who's, your local, who's your inspector for this region? Um, is it Peter? Well, it kind of crosses over. He's Eleanor um, okay. does some in this area. We've never met the other guy Peter? that's supposed to do ours. Okay. So I guess eventually we will. <laughs> Well, he, he, he trucks bees, and he has bees in Mississippi and he trucks to the southeast, so. He's busy. He's busy, yeah. And, and he's out early, so. He too has a beekeeping partner. Mm -hmm. It is fun, it's very interesting. It's the fascinating pictures. Absolutely. I think it's cool. Are you selling money at this point? Oh, we are. Now, do you have um, species or by plant? Well, do you, you have mixed oh, wild with our, our honey? You mean? Mm -hmm. Well, he can explain that because we do keep ours. When we harvest it, we keep each batch separate because they taste totally different and mm -hmm. they look totally different. So we want to be able to have that instead of throwing it all in and having one blend. We like to be able to say, "This is our wildflower. This is our more clover," and you know. It only has to be 40% that to be labeled right. that on the bottle. Right. Right, but we... The thing with wildflower is... Knowing what that mix is. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a mixture of black locusts and honeysuckle, and and you can... It tastes like flowers when you taste it. We had our last batch. We tasted it and went, it tastes citrusy. <laughs> now, we have these citrus plants around here, so we were trying to think it have been the black cat, yep. hmm. Maybe. There's a spicy, citrusy flavor to catnip. And... I don't know that there'd be enough catnip to fill a super with honey. It usually blends it in with the other things. Yeah. I wonder if other mints would do that. Like, there's so much weed gorilla around these tank plants. 